Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Sri Sankar with the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in the Office of Pain Policy and Planning. On behalf of the NIH Pain Consortium Disparities and Diversity Workgroup, I would like to welcome you to the NIH HEAL Initiative Virtual Workshop on Achieving Health Equity. NIH is committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And while there have been policies and guidance around these topics for some time, recent crises surrounding societal disparities and the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us of the urgency to address health inequities. Clinical studies are an essential tool for translating research findings into effective treatments and for supporting improvements in the day-to-day -day lives of patients. And we want to ensure that all populations are participating and benefiting from them. This workshop is one step towards utilizing our collective knowledge and expertise to make progress in health equity and improved outcomes for a person suffering with chronic pain or opioid use disorder. Thank you to our speakers, moderators, and our audience members for attending. We're very excited, and I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Rebecca Baker, the director of the NIH HEAL Initiative. Thank you, Dr. Sankar. Thank you to um, the organizers of the meeting and to all of you for taking part today. It is such a privilege to be part of this group and um, begin today's discussion about health equity in the NIH HEAL or Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative. Next slide, please. So here is the crisis that we are up against. Over the past decade, there has been a dramatic and devastating increase in overdose deaths in communities and families across the country. Um, in 2018, nearly 70,000 Americans died. And that number, unfortunately, in spite of a lot of efforts on behalf of the government has not been going down. Um, as you can see in the maps, communities across the country have been affected. Really, no one has been untouched. And as we all know, disparities in, in health and access to care play a key role in contributing to this crisis. Um, next slide, please. And what we've seen is that it is really rapidly evolving. So what started as an over-reliance and overuse perhaps of prescription opioid medications um, turned into a flood of heroin in the country and then a dangerous and deadly increase in synthetic opioids such as fentanyl together with stimulants such as methamphetamines. And, Tragically, um, during the COVID times, we've seen this um, pattern continue and accelerate such that there's been um, a significant increase just in the past year in drug overdose deaths across the country. So we at NIH and as a research community are really working to take this on and understand the roles we can play in helping to end addiction long-term. And we recognize that durable, scientific solutions to this crisis are not going to um, be limited to only understanding opioid use disorder and opioid misuse, but also address the needs of the millions of Americans who experience pain. Next slide, please. So this is another crisis and another crisis that is contributed to by challenges in bringing evidence-based and effective treatments to people. So 50 million American adults are experience chronic pain. Um, about half of them have severe pain on a daily basis. And 19 to 20, I think million is the latest number, have such impact cr um, chronic pain that they can't go about their day-to-day -day business, can't carry out family responsibilities and other things that bring meaning to their life. So together, recognizing the magnitude and urgency of these two crises, NIH developed the HEAL initiative. Next slide, please. Um, this is our response, our way of rallying the biomedical research community and our partners to take on this challenge. So as you might expect, based on the um, 
many ways that opioids and pain affect our lives and the many disease conditions associated with pain, we have a variety and a really dramatic scope of research within the initiative, 25 or more distinct research programs, ranging all the way from prevention, um, understanding what makes people vulnerable to opioid misuse and addiction, um, some translational research, working to accelerate promising candidates for treating pain and opioid use disorder, um, into trials and into the hands of patients, a large number of clinical studies, um, each seeking to understand for specific pain conditions or in um, specific populations what treatments work best. And then lastly, um, a significant number of implementation science studies, because for a lot of these challenges, we have effective treatments, we have effective interventions, but they're not getting to the people who need them. And so I hope that that's a focus of today's discussion, ways that we can really look at the communities and the settings where people come seeking help and consider ways to bring to them at, at that time and in those places, interventions that work. So we have a really terrific um, assembly of partners in this effort. Um, about half of the different NIH institutes and centers are leading individual programs. The other half are collaborating in one way or another. And then working together with our partners in uh, sister agencies across government and communities and um, settings on the ground. And then working together with the private sector together um, seeking to help bring an end to the addiction and opioid overdose crisis. So oh, next slide, please. And here's a, just a really general overview of the different component parts of the HEAL initiative. It has two overarching goals. First, enhancing pain management, and second, improving treatments for opioid misuse and addiction. Um, both of these um, goals, in order to be effective, will need to take on um, the questions of ensuring the right um, participants in our studies and ensuring that our the outcomes of our research are appropriate and targeted and made available to our different audiences. So um, I won't go into all of the different um, research focus areas within the initiative, but suffice it to say it ranges um, broadly from preclinical pain discovery research to the development of novel medications to new strategies for prevention and treatment and um, a special focus on infants and newborns born exposed to opioids. So um, next slide, please. And instead, I thought it might help um, in the spirit of today's discussion to focus this as a set of um, problems and then considering the ways that research can help because sometimes um, as a biomedical um, investigator and, and community, we can kind of sit back and say, oh, well, that isn't a research question, but in many cases it is. So for instance, many people with opioid use disorder do not receive appropriate treatment. In fact, less than half of people with opioid use disorder um, receive one of the three FDA approved treatments, um, medications, buprenorphine, um, methadone or naltrexone. So what is the role of the, of the NIH? Well, what we're seeking to do is really um, test the integration into the community, into justice settings, into emergency rooms and other places where people come seeking help, approaches to get these medications to people and to um, give them the other support services that they need to stay on medication. And so for instance, the healing community study, which is taking place in um, 67 communities in four states hit hard by the opioid crisis is building um, a set of community collaboratives where they have a menu of evidence-based interventions and the community can pick what works best for them. And that could take into account the needs of rural populations, of urban populations, of um, specific um, racial and ethnic groups in that community, as well as um, building partnerships with um, private sector, faith-based organizations, employers, et cetera, and ways of really building into the research infrastructure, um, those community connections, so important for um, sustaining people in 
um, in treatment. So next slide, please. Another problem that the HEAL initiative is taking on is the need to balance um, the risks of opioid therapy with the need for pain management. So we know that people um, need to have their pain under control in order to go about things that are important to them and to be able to work and be um, do things that are uh, going to give their life meaning to them. But we don't wanna expose them to opioids if it's not going to help them, if it's not going to relieve their pain long-term, or if it's going to put them at undue risk of the side effects or risk of addiction. So HEAL is supporting a number of different clinical studies, both to test novel therapeutics, but also to test the um, effectiveness of specific pain management strategies, such as um, the use of acupuncture to treat chronic low back pain. And we're doing this in partnership. So um, in this case with um, our colleagues in CMS to make sure that as these inter, um, integrated approaches and are tested in the clinic, they can be implemented in real world settings and um, be sustainable um, long term. So next slide, please. I'll quickly just talk about some of the cross cutting themes in HEAL. We have a lot of different research covered within the initiative, but there are some common threads, including the need to make data available. Um, that's not just to our colleagues in the research community, but also um, to our stakeholders and to the public as this is a declared public health emergency. We need to engage with our, um, with our research participants, with people with lived experience, with our stakeholders. Um, if we don't consider how our research findings are going to be meaningful to them, then we're um, not being responsive to the crisis. And then lastly, the importance of partnerships and diversity and inclusion in our research. This is a real world problem. The problem of people dying from opioid overdose, the problem of people with unmanaged pain. And we need to take into consideration the real needs of the real people who have these conditions and um, build that into our research. So next slide, please. Um, over the past year, our entire country and our community at NIH has been grappling with the need to um, address racial and health disparities and HEAL is no exception. Here I have shown different messages from our different leaders and I know you'll hear from Dr. Korshatz later today. Um, and hear his strong feelings, but this is really not optional. This is something that the NIH needs to take on and is taking on. Um, the need to promote health equity through our bio biomedical research. Um, next slide, please. And, um, and one of the tools that we have available to us, and I know we'll hear more about this today, is the importance of meaningful inclusion of people of different and diverse backgrounds into our clinical trials. We have policies at NIH that state the minimum that we um, have research studies that reflect the population of the United States and of the conditions that we're seeking to treat, but we're trying to do a little bit better than that. We're trying to make sure that our studies take into account the needs of those groups and that we serve them through our research. Next slide, please. Uh, there will be lots of ways of doing this. Today will be kind of a, a chance to discuss as a group. We have research funding opportunities both on the street and coming soon. The place where we um, list those is here on the NIH website. So please check it out if you're a researcher and looking for more opportunities. Um, and next slide, please. I'll now just briefly um, give you an outline of what we'll be discussing in today's um, workshop. I'm very pleased to have a terrific group of um, leaders in the field of health equity and research to be um, sharing the workshop with us today. Um, next, you'll hear from Dr. George Mensa of NHLBI. Um, many times in the past year, I've heard about what um, a really groundbreaking and superlative effort SEAL is at NH, so I know um, we'll really learn a lot from that presentation. We'll also get to hear from kind of a personal idol of mine, um, Dr. Nikhila Cook of PCORI, and then we'll have a panel discussion led by Dr. Korshatz, who is the director of 
National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, followed by um, Q&A and opportunity from, for input from the larger group. So thank you again to Sharice for the introduction and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Dr. Mensa, I believe you are next. All right. Um, Shri, is it okay for me to share my screen? Yes, please do. Thank you. Excellent. And if you could give me a signal that you are seeing the screen, please. We can see it. Looks great. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Reese, Dr. Baker. It's a, a real privilege and a pleasure uh, for me to be part of this wonderful uh, workshop. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time to take us through the wonderful overview. Uh, really appreciate it. My task uh, is to um, do three things. Um, first, give a very brief overview of the NIH commitment to diversity and inclusion in clinical studies, um, and then give one example of how we've carried through that commitment. Um, Dr. Baker mentioned the SEAL uh, program. That's an NIH-wide um, community engagement alliance um, against COVID-19 disparities. And then the third thing I'd like to do is convey the message to all of you that at SEAL and across NIH, we're very, very committed and eager uh, to work with HEAL uh, to share uh, all the lessons we've learned just to make sure that collectively we make great progress in what Dr. Baker called meaningful inclusion in our research efforts. Diversity and inclusion, uh, definitely important to us uh, at NIH. Um, we, we know and we understand that diversity and inclusion uh, constitute the foundation of innovation and creativity uh, in clinical studies. However, it's also the law. <laughs> uh, NIH is required by law to ensure the inclusion of women and the inclusion of minority groups uh, in all NIH-funded clinical research, and meaningful inclusion um, so that uh, it will be appropriate to answer the scientific questions uh, under study. The law also requires NIH uh, to support outreach programs uh, for the recruitment of women and uh, members of minority groups uh, in clinical research. And in fact, in the SEAL program that I will mention to you, that's precisely what uh, NIH has done supporting community engagement, supporting outreach, so that we can um, promote and boost inclusive participation uh, in our research response uh, to COVID. This is the law, uh, it's public law 103-43, uh, uh, which stemmed from the NIH Revitalization Act uh, of 1993. Uh, and it specifically calls out three things. One, that women and minorities uh, be included in all clinical studies unless there is a very compelling rationale for exclusion. So the default is meaningful inclusion. Second, the statute requires clinical trials to be designed so that um, they provide information about differences by sex, by gender, uh, by race and or ethnicity. So it's not just include uh, a few women here or include a few Hispanic or Latino persons there, but the study itself must be designed in such a way that the numbers of women and racial and ethnic minorities are meaningful and can result in analysis uh, to determine uh, differences by sex or gender, race and ethnicity. And the whole purpose of doing this and doing it well is to ensure that when we finally have findings from the studies, that they will be generalizable to the entire population. This is a very, very important slide, and I, I'd like to show it a lot. 
there are seven things on there that constitute the most common reasons that are often cited for the underrepresentation of racial and ethnic minorities in clinical research. The first is the lack of trust in research, a lack of trust in the science. And sometimes that is compounded by a lack of trust in government so that when you have government funded research, it really hits a very high bar. Very, very, very important. Often there's also a lack of awareness and a lack of interest in research. Another very important factor is misinformation, and that is crucial. Misinformation about the science, misinformation about the research itself, misinformation about the motives and the intent of the researchers and the funders are uh, really critical in um, uh, reducing uh, representation or reducing uh, inclusion and diversity. Sometimes the research is considered risky. Uh, it could be part of the misinformation. It could be part of a lack of awareness of what is actually being done. Uh, a lack of access is critical. And certainly another very important factor is past research misdeeds that often feeds into the mistrust and makes it really very difficult uh, for us uh, to get the appropriate uh, diversity and inclusion in our studies. Now, I've bolded uh, trust, misinformation, and past misdeeds because um, no matter which community we go into, uh, if we're trying to improve inclusion and diversity, we must take steps uh, to engage, to listen, to understand, uh, so that our, our strategies can be successful. We mentioned SEAL earlier. This is the an NIH wide community engagement alliance uh, against uh, COVID-19 disparities. Uh, and in the box in the middle, it shows that it's an initiative that is designed uh, to lead outreach, engagement, and inclusive participation uh, through our efforts in racial and ethnic minority communities that have been hardest hit uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we begin by establishing or strengthening partnerships within the community. That's first. And through those partnerships, we help grow and boost and increase understanding and trust in science and trust in research. Uh, by doing that, our hope is that we can accelerate the uptake of beneficial treatments, whether they're vaccines uh, or therapeutics uh, or preventive strategies. Uh, and throughout all of this process, every step of the way address misinformation that exists uh, in the communities. Uh, here are the state that we currently uh, fund teams in. Uh, but what I really want to highlight here is it's not just funding for academic research centers. There's a very, very strong emphasis uh, on the academic partners, but they are partners uh, within community-based organizations, uh, healthcare centers and providers, faith-based organizations, um, certainly state and local uh, government agencies, particularly uh, local health departments uh, and other clinical and allied health uh, entities such as uh, nursing networks, community health workers uh, networks, pharmacy networks. It's this entire collective that when brought together can really help uh, and support our efforts at diversity and, and inclusion. Here's the website that we've uh, uh, dedicated to um, bringing together in one place everything we've learned and everything we want to share, uh, make available uh, very widely, not just in the states where we have the alliance, but throughout uh, uh, the US. And I've listed here um, some of the five uh, guiding principles. Uh, I mentioned some of this earlier, but just to emphasize, building and sustaining trust and relationships must come first. Uh, and, and it's really the very start uh, of the work that we do. And very often we have to acknowledge the real importance of social determinants of health. For example, where you put your uh, clinical trial recruitment site can make a huge difference. Um, the hours that you have available for people to participate in, individuals who work uh, two shifts uh, may be available only on weekends or may be available in the evenings. Taking that into account is crucial. 
Not everyone has private uh, modes of transportation. Uh, so all these social determinants uh, must be taken into account at the very beginning as you're designing uh, these studies to make sure that our efforts uh, at diversity and inclusion can be successful. Uh, one of the things we learned from uh, our early efforts in engaging um, our community partners uh, in several forums that we held uh, was this wonderful statement that even in the setting of a pandemic, you cannot rush individuals. We cannot rush the community. If we're going to move fast, we have to move at the speed of trust. So trust is foundational. Uh, and within the communities, there are individuals who are considered trusted uh, messengers, trusted voices, and we have to do everything possible to partner with those trusted uh, voices, those trusted messengers, so we can get our messages out. And then finally, uh, building and maintaining uh, public-private partnerships, as Dr. Baker uh, mentioned. Here are a few examples just to highlight the crucial importance of community-based organizations, uh, a crucial importance of clinician networks. It's not just physicians, uh, nurses, community health workers, social uh, scientists who help within the healthcare environment are all crucial. And we need uh, uh, to leverage and work with and partner with those uh, networks. Uh, Faith-based organizations are critical in many, uh, many community settings. Uh, what I really want to highlight here is the critical importance of tackling, engaging, and addressing misinformation, and always, always, always providing and sharing trustworthy information. We also must leverage uh, not just the local context, but national uh, communications networks whenever available. Uh, we are very fortunate to have outstanding uh, leadership at NIH. Uh, we take advantage of them whenever we can, uh, uh, and we bring them to help get the messages plain. This is only one example uh, of such an effort, uh, working with national uh, organizations uh, and using multi-channel uh, media and communication efforts. How do we know all of this work? Uh, well, that's part of our research effort. Um, um, it, it makes sense, we believe in it, but we also want to uh, have some data to support it. I'm only gonna give you this one example. Uh, it's not a definitive compelling evidence that what we did uh, made that difference, uh, but we think every step of what we do can contribute uh, to promoting diversity and inclusion. So just one example, uh, as you know, NIH, uh, NIH had a very strong partnership uh, with Moderna uh, in their vaccine effort. And when it became very clear that back in uh, end of July and August, uh, there were only about 8% uh, Hispanics um, uh, who had uh, participated in, in the vaccine effort. Af African-Americans or Blacks was only around 4%. Uh, Asia was by 1%. Uh, it was really clear that uh, we needed a major effort to promote diversity and inclusion. It was all hands on deck uh, and all of government approach. Uh, and we did everything that I've mentioned and more uh, so that by mid-September, the numbers had improved to about 16% for Hispanic and Latino, uh, up from around 8 to 10% had gone up from 4% to 7% uh, uh, black uh, and some increases uh, in uh, the others. And even this was not uh, good enough. So we continued to do everything that I mentioned. Uh, and fortunately by the late October, uh, we had uh, gone up to about 20% participation by Hispanic uh, and uh, Latino populations, about 10% African-American, uh, overall almost 37% a, a, a uh, minority uh, participation. So everything that we do um, uh, based on the principles that I mentioned uh, can make a difference. Uh, and so uh, diversity and inclusion is critical. Uh, and we, we are very, very committed to share with HEAL uh, everything that we have learned. Uh, and we're looking forward to uh, working with you in this very, very important uh, initiative. So thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, including me in this effort. I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, and uh, it will be my real
pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Nikhila Cook. Um, all right. Uh, it's a, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to have Dr. Cook with us uh, today. Uh, as you, uh, many of you know, uh, she is a Harvard trained medical doctor. Uh, she's a, a card carrying cardiologist or a heart specialist uh, who also has additional expertise uh, in health services research. Uh, she's uh, the executive director at, at PCORI, which is the Patient Centered uh, Outcomes uh, Research Institute. Uh, and as you know, APICOR was established uh, a decade ago under the Affordable Care Act, uh, and uh, it's been funding comparative clinical effectiveness uh, uh, research with a very, very strong focus on patient-centered uh, outcomes. As the executive director, uh, Dr. Cook provides uh, strategic day-to-day uh, -day oversight uh, of ongoing programs uh, as well as new initiatives that are designed uh, to create a healthcare system that is more efficient, uh, that is more effective, and, and that continues to be more and more patient-centered. Now, prior to joining PCORI, uh, Dr. Cook uh, worked uh, with us, served as a senior scientific officer and the, the chief, uh, chief of staff uh, at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, where I, I was fortunate enough and I had a uh, the pleasure of working with her for more than seven years. I can tell you that she's brilliant, uh, she's insightful, she's warm, uh, she's an outstanding listener, and most importantly, she's someone who cares very, very deeply about diversity and inclusion uh, and efforts to eliminate disparities in health. Uh, throughout her career, she's worked uh, to enhance diversity and equity uh, in clinical care delivery and has been uh, a major leader uh, in all of these efforts uh, for which she's really received uh, numerous awards. So please join me uh, in welcoming uh, Dr. Nikhila Cook, our keynote speaker this afternoon. Uh, and she's gonna be talking about uh, achieving health equity through diversity, inclusion, uh, and engagement. Dr. Cook, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mensa, for your very kind introduction. And I really commend the outstanding work that you described in the SEAL program. And on behalf of PCORI, I'd like to thank the organizers and wonderful colleague, Dr. Rebecca Baker, for hosting this workshop and for your kind invitation to participate. Good afternoon, everyone. I am just so pleased to be here with you today. There's so much to talk about as we consider ways to ensure health equity amongst all Americans. And forums like this are just invaluable for assessing where we are and helping to chart our path forward to ensure the health and well being of all children, adults, families, and communities. I'm really honored to be here because this meeting aligns with so many of my personal passions. My commitment to health equity began long before my professional career. I was actually raised in Bessemer, Alabama. It's a small majority black town outside of Birmingham. And from a young age, I recognized differences in health across the communities that I witnessed, even though concepts like disparities or even health equity had not yet clearly been elucidated like they are today. And I was really motivated by those disparities in my neighborhood to attend University of Alabama at Birmingham and Harvard Medical School and to become a physician and researcher. But soon I faced a really critical decision. I had to decide how I could decrease health disparities and better enhance diversity and equity in research and care delivery. Was it as a clinician and a researcher or as a leader in health institutions? And I made a decision to follow a path of leadership that compelled me to pursue opportunities at NIH and PCORI but with the fortune of such positions is such a great responsibility to reach many in any effort that we can to improve health in a more significant way and pursue equity and health access and outcomes. And so throughout this talk and beyond, I really invite you to help us enhance our culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion to ensure we are accomplishing our shared mission of improving healthcare delivery and outcomes for all Americans. With that, let's go to the next slide and begin with some foundational definitions. 
Terms such as equity and equality have become so important in our lexicon recently, but the differences between them are important in order to drive toward health equity. Equality, as you can see on the left side of this slide, really ensures that each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. While equity, which you see on the right side of this slide, acknowledges that there are different circumstances and needs and provides the resources and opportunities to promote an equal outcome. Let's go to the next slide. So to expand further, what do we really mean when we talk about health equity? Well, the World Health Organization defines the term as the absence of unfair or avoidable or remediable differences in health population amongst group and health amongst population groups. But these differences can stem from many things like social, economic, demographic, or geographic factors. And just more simply put, the CDC refers to health equity as when everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of socially determined circumstances. And last year, as we've all been talking about, increased attention and renewed commitment to health equity emerged as our nation grappled with two converging crises, a pandemic of unprecedented scale and consequence, as well as civil unrest following the senseless deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. But as this pandemic continues, health disparities by race and ethnicity have undeniably revealed a disproportionate burden of underlying conditions that affect health and their drivers. Drivers that include socioeconomic status, access to care, and occupation and housing related exposure to the virus. Next slide. As you've heard in the news and even today, Black Americans are nearly three times more likely than white Americans to die of COVID-19 and nearly four times more likely to be hospitalized. And similar rates are found for American Indian populations and Latinx Americans. And I don't have to inform this audience that the effects of COVID-19 are being seen across other health issues, including opioid use disorder. Over 81,000 drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States in the 12 months that ended in May of 2020. This is the highest number of overdose deaths ever recorded in a 12 month period, according to the CDC. And synthetic opioids appear to be driving that increase, rising almost 40% in that 12 month period leading up to May of 2020, compared with the 12 months that led up to June of 2019. As we consider these issues today, we believe PCORI has a critical role to play in working to ensure health equity and sharing what we've learned. Let's go to the next slide. And that work really starts with our mission, which is to assist all people in making informed healthcare decisions and to improve health outcomes and care delivery. And we use the tools of high integrity, evidence-based information from research that's guided and governed by patients, caregivers, and the broader healthcare community. Let's go to the next slide. Moving toward health equity will require leveraging those tools in a multifaceted approach to eliminate health disparities and its root causes, such as racism, discrimination, and bias, and to address the social determinants of health amongst other actions. And diversity, equity, diversity inclusion, and engagement serve as pillars undergirding this approach. And I wanna take each one of them in turn and walk them through with you today. Next slide. We live in an incredibly diverse nation and one that's becoming even more so. Last June, the US Census Bureau released statistics that vividly illustrate our increasing diversity. As you can see here in the year 2000, white residents comprise nearly 70% of the nation's population and census officials estimate estimate that they represented 60% of the populace by 2019. And during the same period, the population of Black Americans inched up from 12% to 12.5%, and the population of Asian Americans increased from less than 4% to nearly 6%. But notably, the Latinx population increased from about 13% to over 18%. Next slide. So an imperative to achieve health equity is reflecting and representing 
that diversity of our nation and everything that we do. And research is certainly no exception, but we face challenges in every phase of research from processes to, to participation. And these difficulties include reaching populations nationally underrepresented in research, including communities of color, as well as building a diverse applicant and funded pool of investigators and successfully including and recruiting diverse study participants. There are challenges of bringing a focus to research topics that are relevant to underserved communities. And as we've been talking about today, building trust in those communities. One of PCORI's funded projects sought to address health disparities in Boston's neighborhoods and serves as an important example of practical approaches and strategies to try to enhance diversity. This health center in the community convened patients, caregivers, clinicians, policymakers, and popular opinion leaders as advocates and activists for change. And now they're building community capacity by providing tools of engagement to enhance the understanding and benefits of research and practice and policy. And their goal is to increase stakeholder participation and representation on institutional review boards at institutions and patient family advisory councils at hospitals. And they're also developing community consensus research agendas, organizing and formalizing a community research network and identifying, recruiting, and mentoring junior academic researchers of color. So we in the research field could certainly take some lessons from this Boston project by creating and revitalizing mentorship programs that are focused on developing a diverse pool of applicants that are primed for success in obtaining research funding, by diversifying our representation in things like merit review and diversifying study participation. At PCORI, we're committed to building on and supporting further efforts to bring in more diverse applicants, but no single institution can solve these systemic problems alone. PCORI does have two special functions. First, we have a core national priority to fund research that's focused on eliminating health disparities, which necessitates a focus on diversity. And second, we're committed to broaden and diversifying the community leading and participating in research. And we're examining our research portfolio to identify and eliminate racism or bias in the funding process. And that includes issues related to the pool of applicants, the review process we use to reach our funding decisions and participation in the research enterprise. But we're also revitalizing and doubling down on recruitment of diverse merit and peer reviewers as well as advisory panelists to ensure our work includes traditionally underrepresented communities in everything we do. Let's go to the next slide and consider inclusion as a second key pillar to achieving health equity and specifically how we can move from inclusion to engagement as true partners and equal partners in research. So the CDC defines inclusion as a set of behaviors that encourages everyone to feel valued for their unique qualities and to experience a sense of belonging. Traditionally, as we talked about, and you heard from Dr. Mensa, funders and researchers set targets for inclusion in studies, and that's critically important. But challenges occur on following theoretical targets to actual recruitment and enrollment rates in historically excluded communities. And let's consider chronic pain, for example, a high burden health problem, as Dr. Baker mentioned, particularly amongst socioeconomically disadvantaged individuals. And compared to the general population, these individuals have a higher incidence of chronic pain and limited access to pain treatment. In one of PCORI's funded studies, cognitive behavioral therapy and pain education material tailored to match patients' education levels significantly lessen pain compared to usual care. And people who attended education or therapy sessions also reported better physical function than people who are receiving usual care. And these types of non-pharmacological approaches could help manage chronic pain and reduce the need for opioids. I'm proud to say this study was based in Alabama, my home state, and included nearly 300 patients. And from an inclusion perspective, 67% of the participants were black, 68% had a high school degree or less, and nearly three quarters of participants had very low incomes. 
most of them read actually at a seventh grade level. But when the study involves staff and patients from rural community health centers in planning and executing the research, it shifted from inclusion to engagement. Patients reviewed the assessment materials and suggested that materials be read aloud to participants to increase their understanding, enhancing the benefit of the work. Next slide. So when we talk about engagement, we reference this particular project. And one of the biggest perceived impacts of engagement was recruitment and retention of study participants. Patient coordinators served as telephone recruiters and eligibility screeners, and they fielded calls from participants. They also served to encourage and reinforce patient participation and often made face-to-face check-ins, even when participants attended a non-study medical appointment, showing that they truly cared. And these extra efforts meaningfully influence the research team's ability to recruit and retain participants in the study. And the Global Healthy Living Foundation is applying these lessons learned from the Alabama study in a PCORI funded dissemination project that's creating a multi-stakeholder coalition of patients, patient advocates, researchers, and physicians. And this coalition will prepare people living with arthritis and chronic pain to act as ambassadors in disseminating evidence-based information on effective chronic pain management to their peers in their community. These projects speak to the importance of reaching historically excluded communities and partnering with trusted members of these communities as research partners and ambassadors. The projects also illustrate one facet of PCORI that we believe is essential to reach to research success. And that's our emphasis on requiring projects to engage communities during the entire research cycle. And by engagement in research at PCORI, we actually mean the involvement of patients caregivers, clinicians, insurers, and others in every aspect of the research process. Let's go to the next slide. An engagement at every step of the way begins with topic development and it extends through merit review, funding and conduct of research and dissemination of findings. Engaging communities as partners changes and expands the face of research from hospital and clinical systems to trusted voices and partners from neighborhoods and communities. Engagement provides entree for diverse and underserved individuals as equal partners in research and begins to build capacity in these historically excluded communities. So finally, we must employ diversity, inclusion, and engagement to build trust on the part of patients and communities in research, science, and healthcare and while the HEAL initiative is focused on pain and opioid misuse and addiction, COVID-19 provides powerful motivation to address the challenge of trust. And it offers a transformative learning opportunity for all of us involved in healthcare and research. While underserved communities are amongst those with the highest hospitalization and death rates from COVID-19, the research community faces a daunting paradox. This pandemic necessitates research with underserved and historically excluded communities, those that are most adversely affected. But they're also the communities with the greatest degree of distrust of the research enterprise. So let's consider some of the vaccine data and go to our next slide. Data from a recent poll conducted in January reveals the will willingness of communities to receive COVID-19 vaccination and shows that that willingness has remarkably increased amongst Americans, with six in 10 American adults indicating a willingness to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. However, when you look at that breakdown by race and ethnicity, only 48% of black adults report a willingness to receive the vaccine compared to 62% of white adults and 67% of Latinx adults. Yet studies have documented that black adults are more likely to participate in clinical research when asked if their questions are answered and any additional time for consideration is granted. Comparative research studies on which approaches work best to communicate about vaccines is one step we could take to reestablish trust and increase the number of American adults who accept vaccination. An experience at PCORI has demonstrated that 
ensuring that historically excluded communities serve as equal partners in the research process builds trust and trustworthiness, and it enhances diverse participation in research. Establishment of meaningful partnerships and trust with affected communities as research partners is going to be central to the path forward, beginning with identifying and involving community brokers and subsequent identified community entities. And engaging communities as partner also changes, as we talked about, that face of research to neighborhood and community trusted voices and partners. And having diverse participation in research and diverse partners involved at every step of the way would enhance the trust amongst communities of color. And this is a very tall order for the health research enterprise, necessitating innovation, new partnerships, and breaking from the tradition of research designed and implemented only in labs, hospitals, and academic centers. Next slide. So the health equity issues brought to the fore by the COVID-19 pandemic and by a legacy of racial and ethnic discrimination and inequality of access and opportunity are of paramount concern and an urgent call to action. And our path ahead is quite clear. Stemming the tide from COVID-19 and truly fulfilling the HEAL mission will require research that is patient, participant, community, and public-centric and the application of lessons learned from research in this devastating pandemic to create long-term public health impact. With your help and the help of many others like you, we will build a strategic action plan that meets the exigent issues we face as researchers, patients, caregivers, and citizens. And we must ensure we interlace health equity into all that we do, fully engage diverse and inclusive stakeholders in our research, and develop and invest in partnerships with communities. Importantly, we must leverage diversity, inclusion, and engagement to innovate, to advance patient-centered learning healthcare, accelerate the path from evidence to implementation, and apply pragmatic approaches to ensuring health equity. As we walk the path toward a healthier America for all, Let's harness the power of diversity, inclusion, and engagement to guide our way. Next slide. I'd like to thank you for your attention, for the kind invitation to participate in this important webinar, and look forward to hearing the rest of the discussion today on this very important topic that's near and dear to me. Thank you very much. Dr. Cook, this is Dr. Walter Koroshetz from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. I want to um, particularly uh, thank uh, Dr. Menser for his presentation on the potential solutions that have come out of the SEAL project that we hope to adopt to increase the value of the HEAL studies uh, to improve health equity. And uh, thank you, Dr. Cook, for sharing the lessons learned from the patient centered outcomes research, so aptly named and how to improve outcomes for all. And now we're going to bring in a group to help uh, start the conversation, get some questions going on how we can actually build uh, research capacity and trust in the community um, so that uh, the folks who participate in research feel that they are making a contribution to the health of their own communities. And in doing so, I am uh, really uh, happy to a co-moderate um, with uh, Dr. Beth uh, Dornell. Uh, Beth is the Associate Professor of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine at Stanford, Director of the Stanford Pain Relief Innovations Lab. And she leads NIH and PCORI funded clinical trials that broadly investigate behavioral medicine for acute and chronic pain. So Beth, would you like to introduce our uh, first uh, panelist? Sure. Thank you, Walter, and thank you all for being here. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of um, introducing Dr. Jonathan Jackson, who is the Director of Community Access, Recruitment, and Engagement Research Center at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So please welcome Dr. Jackson, and you may share your screen. All right, um, thank you all so much uh, for hanging on. We've had uh, some genuinely incredible presentations already so far. So 
Um, I'm going to try to to shorten a little bit of my presentation uh, because we I don't want to necessarily spend too much time covering old ground. Uh, but uh, welcome, and it's it, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're about to spark. Uh, so my presentation slides are really focused on uh, trying to lay the groundwork for the conversation that we're going to be having uh, over the next uh, few minutes. And I think this is the place that we have to start. Um, so normally when I give a presentation, especially if I'm giving a presentation in February, uh, you know, I'm very much inclined to, to, uh, to quote Dr. Martin Luther King and his really famous statement uh, about uh, inequities in health and health care. Um, but I think, you know, given the, the speakers that we've had already uh, so far, what we need to talk about is how we actually do it. What is the work that needs to be done? How do we make the adjustments to our workflows? Um, and, and for me, when we're thinking very concretely and practically uh, about the problem of recruitment and especially inclusive and diverse recruitment, uh, I come back to this, which is lasagna's law, which is, is uh, um, has been well-defined for decades, well beyond or well before uh, we as a field uh, started paying attention to issues of, of diversity and representation and research. And it's just written here, the incidence of patient availability sharply decreases when a clinical trial begins and returns to its original level as soon as the trial is completed. Uh, and what that basically says is, I think that expresses the sentiment that we all feel we're conducting our clinical research studies, which is that it's just so much harder than we thought uh, to do any recruitment, uh, much less diverse recruitment. And in our heads and in our plans, um, it's certainly easy to be very optimistic in that view. Um, but when we're actually in the trenches working on this, uh, that's when things get really difficult. And it's difficult only as long as the trial is going on, as soon as it comes time to write that report, write that paper, or propose that next grant, uh, that, that uh, putative incidence of patient availability goes right back up. Uh, so that is the problem that we're trying to combat today. When we talk about the problem of diversity, equity, and inclusion, when we talk about the, the problem of equity and clinical trials, especially when we're talking about pain studies, um, we have three problems in particular. There's no slide for this, but I just want you to keep in mind. Uh, the problem is of implementation, as we heard Dr. Baker mention earlier. The problem is of measurement, as we've also heard um, this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. Uh, and we, finally, we have a, a, a more significant problem of selection. So those are the three problems that we as research scientists need to really clamp down on before we're going to see any movement of the needle uh, when it comes to equity. So those, those three problems, once again, are implementation, measurement, and selection. And so uh, what I'm gonna be doing is, is talking a little bit about why these things are important. So if we think about the problem of diversity within clinical research contexts, I think for many folks, the problem is, is one of social justice. The, one, the problem is, uh, is inherently this moralistic view of equity, um, but there are scientific justifications uh, for trying to, to, to move the needle on this as well. Uh, so very famously, Ramamurthy and colleagues uh, about six years ago published a paper showing that one in five FDA approvals had some kind of meaningful difference uh, in, in exposure or response uh, as a function of race or, race or ethnic group alone. Uh, so that particular paper didn't look at other uh, um, uh, markers or identifiers of minority or minoritized status. Um, but the thinking is that uh, if we see it for race and ethnicity, we're likely to see it as well uh, for gender. We're going to be seeing it for uh, um, uh, elements of income or educational attainment or whether you live in um, you know, a rural or urban or suburban environment. Um, we also know uh, that a lot of representation issues that we see are particularly acute. They are particularly vicious uh, in our most advanced therapies. Uh, so historically, you know, that was when we were starting to explore uh, things like radiation, and there are many, many stories of uh, horrific medical abuses. Uh, because things have changed since Tuskegee, because we have the Belmont Report in place, uh, the kinds of abuses that we see, uh, the kinds of concerns that we see have shifted. Uh, instead of uh, abuse, the problem is neglect. And we are seeing this problem neg uh, of neglect, uh, particularly in, in areas like precision or personalized medicine, we're talking about uh, thinking about the era of big data. We're thinking about cancer studies, and of course, our cutting edge therapies today. So, uh, you know, all of the research that we're putting out in the HEAL network without uh, a very clear plan uh, for addressing equity are likely to continue to perpetuate uh, these same problems with, with representation issues, which then leads to the problem that you see here with the Remamorthy paper. Uh, and then finally, if you think about things from a, a, a measurement and selection problem, 
uh, we see from epidemiology that selection and survival biases uh, that we introduce into our data by uh, selecting people into a clinical trial, they tend to skew uh, estimates of a lot of different things, but it, that also includes our causal factors. Uh, so put another way, uh, without diversity, without representation in our research studies, uh, we are artificially uh, manipulating the signal to noise ratio in our research models. So the problem is not just one of social justice, it's not just one of morality of, of equity and inclusion, but we're doing bad science. Uh, and so the, the question here is not necessarily how can we achieve health equity, how can we achieve diversity, the question is how can we be good scientists, how can we be compliant with federal law. So if we look at uh, a paper that was recently published um, by a colleague of mine, Latrice Landry, uh, in Health Affairs back in 2018, we can actually look at the study populations in our largest genotypic and phenotypic data sets. Um, so most relevantly for this particular group, we can see uh, that the European population uh, tends to be dominant, uh, even though from a global perspective, the European population is about 9% of the global population. Uh, so we, we see a massive problem of over-representation over here, but it actually goes a little bit further. If you dive into the other categories that we have here, uh, we see some representation from Asians. However, this is not uh, all Asians. This does not represent South or Southeast Asians, uh, and it doesn't even tend to represent um, uh, fully East Asian populations. Uh, if you dive into this paper, you see that most of the Asian population that's represented here are just Han Chinese. Uh, so we have Western Europeans, Han Chinese, and then literally a group um, that is this labeled as underrepresented groups, which is just everyone else. Uh, and you can see that for some of these categories like neurological phenotypic databases, uh, we have virtually no representation uh, in our pursuit of big data. So for, for uh, you know, the studies across the heel uh, initiative, uh, including my own, uh, where I work with EpicNet, we have a lot of work to do. And we have to start off from an assumption that we are going to be bad at, uh, at achieving health equity. We have to assume uh, that our default right now is failure. Um, and if we look at uh, a little bit more broadly, so you know, moving the, need, the, the kind of our scope beyond just genotypic and phenotypic databases, uh, we can look at the FDA drug trial snapshots. Um, so this is the, the latest data from 2019. I think the 2020 data will be available probably in the next few weeks, but we're not quite there yet here on February 1st. Um, so if you look at these data compared to the US population, you might think, you know, we're not doing too bad. So this was before the coronavirus, uh, before we had a lot of these initiatives that we heard about earlier today um, that really went to mobilize and work within uh, minoritized communities. Uh, and you, you might think we're, we're doing all right. However, uh, this is where I, I put on my, my slight stats nerd hat. And I remind you that means, averages, don't necessarily tell you the whole story. So if we look at the average across all of these research studies, you, you would come to the conclusion that we're doing pretty okay. Um, but if you plot this as a median instead of a mean, uh, which looks means that you look for that middle number across all of the, the drugs that were approved in 2019, you see that the truth is much lower. It's much worse uh, in terms of representation and diversity than you would have expected. Uh, we don't have as many women as we think. We don't have as many Black or African Americans. We don't have as many Asians, uh, people of Hispanic or Latino identity. We don't even have as many older adults um, as we thought if you calculate the median rather than the mean uh, for these data. So that is on top of lots of other questions in terms of basic reporting of diversity, which is what is an Asian even? Uh, and what is it? And what do we mean when we're talking about uh, Hispanic? Does that in, does that include everybody that we that we're also talking about when we're talking about Latino or Latinx populations, or are we really just talking about Hispanic populations and individuals who are you know Latino or Latinx without being Hispanic are somehow not counted in this particular category? So we we have to do a much better when it comes to basic reporting structures uh, when it comes to our our diversity. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be much more challenging to know whether we're even successful. Just a quick nerd. Uh, so, it, it, you know, if you're if you're satisfied with measures of central tendency, that's fine. I also popped in uh, just a quick measure of dispersion, which is uh, even more telling of the lack of representation and diversity across the broader scope of studies. Uh, but I'll skip that for now and come back to it for the Q and A. Uh, so, if you want to summarize the state of diverse recruitment. 
um, especially in clinical research studies and, and HEAL and the initiatives uh, therein are no exception. We know that there are lots of individual papers uh, published across many different disciplines, uh, but ultimately the field of diverse recruitment itself, of representative engagement, recruitment, and retention to clinical research studies is pretty fragmented. Uh, so most of these, most articles that you find are going to focus on uh, case studies. Uh, the metrics that you're going to see will only be discussing enrollment. Uh, and the, ultimately, the conclusions um, that, that you see from these papers really focus on advice that is really tough to operationalize, um, it much less or much more. Um, it's tough to, to replicate and to measure sustainably. We have lots of confounds when it comes to understanding the problem of diversity and, represent and representation uh, in our clinical research studies. So, you know, I, I think that the problem is, is so stark that it comes down to, to sort of one theory that most of the diversity and recruitment that we're able to receive, you know, the successes that we, that we even saw in the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, is that really just the byproduct of charismatic underpaid clinical research coordinators? Is it just one person who's connected to the right church or the right community who is driving the bulk of that research? And if the answer is yes, or frankly, if the answer is even maybe, uh, then we've got a big problem on our hands. And we have to understand that it may not be a matter of getting the right kinds of community conversations, the right kind of initiatives, but rather just the right, the right way to, to, you know, the right issue uh, may simply be in, in finding that charismatic individual. Or uh, we can try to, you know, be true scientists about it and try to operationalize um, and create a, a true data ontology or a data framework uh, around these issues. Uh, we, I think one of the, the biggest problems that we have right now, especially if we, if we characterize uh, a lack of representation in our research uh, purely as a, an issue of hesitancy or mistrust is, is that we fail to deconfound whether research opportunities are available um, you know, versus whether they are just uh, accessible. And so what I mean by that is um, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if you are in a community that uh, say has a large minority population and you are uh, sort of presenting a research opportunity, uh, then that means that you have made it available. Uh, but unless you understand the challenges, uh, and, and more importantly, if, unless you have addressed those challenges, uh, then you're not making a research study truly accessible. And then finally, you know, more importantly, we, we, we tend to conflate uh, these different topics of outreach, recruitment, retention, and engagement. We sort of treat them all like they're the same thing uh, when they are wildly different activities uh, and need to be measured and implemented accordingly. Um, more importantly, when it comes to this issue of, of lack of diversity, um, we have a problem with infrastructure. Uh, so as we learned, uh, you know, back in June when we, when we had all that civic unrest that we've all largely forgotten about, um, what we realized is that racism is not just uh, what we learned about in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, where it was one-to-one -one individual. Uh, a lot of the problems that we have when it comes to a lack of diversity uh, is infrastructural, it's systemic. Uh, and the problem is that we've either uh, put the burden of that on individual research participants or individual research teams uh, to address. And usually neither one of these stakeholder groups have uh, the time, expertise, or resources to actually solve this problem. Uh, and so then, you know, ultimately, you know, if you want to, to try to uh, boil down the problems, the reasons why people don't participate in research studies, what you'll do is you'll get a list. And we, we've, we saw a list a little bit earlier, but if you, if you widen the scope a little bit, you might get a list that includes uh, some of these particular reasons. Um, however, the trouble is that we don't historically uh, do a good job of, of ordering these in any kind of workflow. Uh, we have no way of understanding uh, ahead of time which of these problems is most important, which one is paramount to address. Um, and so what we do is we, we kind of leave this as, as a list and we sort of blindly pick uh, whatever is the easiest to address, whatever we have the resources uh, in order to solve. And uh, it's, it's tough to know about these reasons in context. So if you take uh, you know, the, the common reasons, it's also possible to just map them uh, into an ordered workflow where the common, you know, the common factors that prevent uh, minoritized and, and underserved populations participating in research uh, can be um, uh, demonstrated as an ordered workflow, uh, as you can see here. And so what you have here on the left is a, a, a way of understanding uh, where you should begin. So if you have a problem of mistrust, uh, that's worth addressing. But if you don't uh, at least uh, address the problem of awareness before that, 
uh, you're likely to meet with, with, uh, with limited results um, that are uh, tough to generalize. So, uh, you know, what that means, uh, I think more practically speaking, is that you can basically create this inverted triangle of individuals that you're trying to reach at any particular time uh, in, the, uh, in the engagement, the recruitment, or retention of individuals into a research study. And so I'm not going to get into the details of what this means, but what um, of what each of these levels means. But the the overall takeaway point um, is that if you are working in a research study and you're struggling with diversity, you may be able to implement different kinds of solutions based on uh, the perception of the kind of problem that you're facing. So uh, I'm working uh, in the early pain phase. Uh, excuse me, the early phase pain investigation clinical network or EpicNet. Uh, which is really focused on, on trying to enhance treatments uh, for, for acute and chronic pain, uh, but to do it in a way that, uh, that reduces the use of, of some of these very addictive opioids. Um, so we have actually started with the, you know, this problem of implementation where we are recognizing that it's tough to find sites uh, that are really thoughtful about uh, or, or, or have the resources to truly include everyone from the get-go. So instead of uh, you know, just working on engagement activities or trust, or instead of just working on, on, on elements of selection criteria uh, or an inclusion exclusion criteria for a study, we're actually going back and saying, who are we picking uh, to be the sites that represent us in our research studies across this clinical trial network? Um, and uh, you know, who are we actually asking to, to serve as PIs within those individual sites? Uh, and so we're revisiting the way that we're writing our, our, um, our, our research protocols to include explicit tasks around recruitment uh, as well as measures. And uh, you know, beyond that, we, we actually have a, a quite a broad set of activities. So instead of just limiting it to, to trying to build trust and engagement, we're working on raising awareness through a, a brand identity campaign. Um, you know, we're making sure that we are visible and accessibly visible uh, to all individuals who may want to take advantage of our research studies. Um, we have a, a large work group of individuals um, across all of the sites within EpicNet and our hubs uh, to build a recruitment and feasibility working group uh, so that we can truly define uh, the challenges and the barriers and uh, work towards solutions that we can implement system-wide and making sure that we have uh, resources and expertise and support in order to implement those. Uh, we also have hub-driven engagement activities, making sure that those responses and those efforts are local at all times uh, in order not just to build that trust, but to truly drive interest and in education in the research protocols that we're offering, uh, that we're offering in EpicNet. And then we're having uh, basically two levels of uh, patient engagement. Uh, so we're going to have an overall patient advisory board uh, at the level of the, of the network itself uh, to help us uh, uh, reimagine what research studies can look like, minimizing uh, patient burden and maximizing patient centricity. Uh, and then for individual protocols that are coming through the clinical trial network, uh, we are going to be having a series of, of, of patient consultation uh, standing subcommittees uh, that will ensure that every single protocol um, is, is able to, to really maximize return of value um, so that everybody, uh, individuals, uh, as well as the communities that they're situated in and their families are getting something out of it. Uh, and so then finally, you know, over the in coming years, we're going to be looking uh, uh, much more concretely about things like data collection protocols and, uh, our, analysis and our analytic plans to ensure that these elements aren't uh, necessarily excluding individuals either. So uh, that's the end of my slides. It's just a kind of a quick, and, a quick view of what we have in mind uh, within EpicNet. I'm happy to answer much more detailed questions during the Q&A, but I want to pass it along to the other members of our, of our panel. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Jonathan. And now I'd like to turn to Amy, Dr. Amy Elliott. She's the professor of pediatrics at University of South Dakota and the chief clinical research officer at a Vera Research Institute Center and has lots of experience in working in different communities, especially working with American Indian tribes for 20 years on a variety of projects. Amy? Thank you very much. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here today and be amongst this panel. And I think this topic is something so near and dear to many of our hearts and probably a lot of the reasons of why many of us went into medicine and science. And so what I'd like to just tell you a little bit is a little bit of our story of trying to bring cutting edge research to the prairie, uh, which tends to not maybe be the first place when people think of when they think of a research powerhouse and how we've really tried to um, work directly with and, and develop this uh, with communities uh, to have the most meaning in our region. 
And so just a little bit about uh, where I'm from is uh, based in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, located about right here. I'm part of the Avera Health System, which is a large rural health system uh, in the United States uh, that has, as you can see in yellow, a good chunk of the Midwest, uh, and then also a professor at the University of South Dakota School of Medicine. So South Dakota has this dichotomy that exists, and I know it exists also in many other states as well, where we have this just profound beauty um, that exists within our state and this vibrant culture uh, that also is extremely present. And then coupled with um, abject poverty uh, that rivals third world countries uh, and living conditions that the social determinants of health uh, very much uh, hold true in terms of leading then to very poor health outcomes for, for a large chunk of our, our, especially our American Indian population. And so when we think of research in these contexts, and this is a public health model I'm sure many of you are familiar with, when we look from defining the problem all the way to interven um, implementing interventions, that this takes uh, about 17 years that is an awfully long time when we're asking communities and participants to be patient with us, uh, that the research that we're doing really does matter to them and, and questioning and being a bit humble about what is it we're really offering in this moment and how can we continuously work on getting better? And so it's not all gloom and doom though. And I do wanna show, uh, sometimes it's hard to measure progress, especially with some of these bigger markers um, and health outcomes. This is infant mortality by race. And the what the line here, the orange and the red that kind of jog along that, this is the United States infant mortality rate from 1990 to 2019. And this darker red is the South Dakota as a whole infant mortality rate. This purple line here that you see if I was to put a, uh, put a trend line with this, um, as I would tell my students, if you put a marble on it, it runs downhill, that's a descending trend. And as you can see here, there's a nice descending trend. This is American Indian infant mortality rate in South Dakota. Over the past 30 years, this rate has went from being almost 2.7 times higher uh, than the general rate in the state as a whole to really being, there's still a disparity here. There's still, there's still a gap that we're, we're still working to fill. But as you can see, there's a nice story of success here. That's the um, result of state agencies, uh, tribal agencies, local companies, uh, healthcare, uh, federal. Um, and But research, I also think, has played a part in this. Uh, so not all of these things, they can sometimes be overwhelming. We think of health disparities in, and like a, a somewhat even a lost cause. Um, and this has been one uh, slide we go back to frequently uh, to show, you know, actually just stick with it and um, keep working and doing the right thing and uh, good things can happen. So um, our work that started actually uh, in this time period uh, with the tribes uh, is called the pre um, PASS prenatal alcohol SIDS and stillbirth. And this was based off of um, findings from the late 1990s uh, that showed the role of prenatal alcohol exposure in particular on sudden infant death syndrome. And so uh, in combination with many other wonderful groups uh, funded by NIH, we were funded to develop some pilot tests and then also to do a very large scale hypothesis driven study. Over 12,192 pregnancies were enrolled and we also had a very extended phase two. The reason for this is NIH was really committed to helping find answers for these participating communities. And so even though the birth numbers were relatively low and it took a little longer uh, for us to be able to meet our power estimates, um, that they really wanted us to be able to answer questions about our region that um, oftentimes will get underrepresented. South Africa was also participating. However, again, this is a really long time to keep community members engaged, uh, to keep agencies engaged, uh, especially when you're blind to a lot of the data as it comes across. This, what ended up happening through the Safe Passage Study is an extremely robust study protocol emerged in maternal child health. We would see women early on in pregnancy, multiple times throughout the pregnancy. We saw them at the time of birth, one month and then 12 months. So kind of had to navigate that um, period of time uh, over the point of delivery where a lot of times you can uh, lose participants and, and lose contact with them. Numerous study elements with this that were happening in, in extremely diverse um, areas of the country in the, North, in the Northern Plains we had five sites, uh, three in more urban areas and two on tribal nations. And uh, we had 86% compliance for all study visits. And there was a lot of study visits with lots of very detailed biospecimens, uh, Doppler ultrasound um, studies, uh, 
biospecimens for genetic studies. Um, it, and just a whole lot of nuances with it that uh, at first glance, um, you would think would be quite challenging and it was. So I present this in, in a matter of a couple of minutes when really it did take years uh, to get this um, established. Some of the collaborations that we, and conversations we really needed to have, especially around American Indian cultural issues was around the collection of tissue, especially postpartum, um, post, um, post, post mortem um, tissue, as well as bloods. And where the tribes ended up landing was that it should be up to the individual choice and there should be options on the consent. Now, all of these conversations happened before the study started. And in fact, there were many times when I said, is this even the right thing to do? Should we be even bringing this to the table? But the science was intriguing. They wanted to see answers to these questions. And this was the resulting uh, decision that they were very comfortable with. Um, also genetic studies, knowing that there was a lot of questions about how those are being done, they requested a separate informational sheet on genetics. Well, how well did it work? We had over 98%, almost 99% consent for DNA. Uh, for research purposes. Uh, placenta tissue, very high. Photographs for the infant face. Withdrawal of overall study consent, 3%. Uh, a lot of those were moving uh, from the area. And also we were able to um, determine pregnancy outcome of 96.5%. So all of those things in that research study tried to shine a light on where some needs were in Indian country for more infrastructure. Um, tribes had a desire to do their own regulatory, their own review, to have control over what research was happening on their lands, what would happen with the data, and where it would go from there. And in collaboration with all of those conversations, we applied to NIHMHD for the Collaborative Research Center for American Indian Health, specifically to help tribes build their research infrastructure, collaboration and partnership, and then also to help bring research innovation that they were interested to those different individual um, tribes. Um, this ended up resulting in, in tremendous long lasting relationships that continue today. And so for us, this community based uh, research, again, is it's not an option, it's a priority in everything we do. And a lot of it does come down to also leadership and that many of us, and I, this is one of my favorite quotes of the most productive innovative teams were led by people who are both task and relationship oriented. What's more, these leaders change their style during the project. My guess is most of us on this call are pretty good at the task oriented. And for community-based research, you really do need to use both task oriented and really research relationship oriented approaches. And that's important from the very top down. Um, just hiring someone to serve as a community engagement coordinator is, is a good initial step, but you have to model those at every step of leadership in the project. You need to know your, un, your organizational culture, how you're perceived as well what your role is and being a little humble about that, uh, your long-term goal and realizing we all operate in multiple cultures. Cannot underestimate listening. Uh, you might feel like you're hearing the same message over and over again, but there's a reason people are feeling the need to repeat it. It's because it's important. Infallible follow through. Do not drop the ball, infallible. Let people know they can count on you. And realizing the specific thing isn't the most important task on their plate. Uh, and being very humble about what you offer. Communication, champions at every level of organizations, making everyone know they truly are part of a team and really getting regular feedback. Uh, so again, another quote that we talk about frequently is coming together as a beginning. I often think about that with community advisory boards. Get a community advisory board, coming together as a beginning, keeping people involved is progress, but working together is success. And so uh, thank you to NIH that has um, helped fund this work for the last 20 years. And this is the team that really does make it happen. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. Um, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, which is Dr. Diana Burgess. She's a professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota and also a VA core investigator at the Center for Care Delivery and Outcomes Research in the Minnesota VA healthcare system. Welcome, Dr. Burgess. Hi, thank you. I'm just going to um, grab my presentation. Let's see. Well, this was incredible. Incredible. It's such an exciting um, opportunity. So the title of my talk is Increasing Diversity and Inclusion in Clinical Trials, Lessons Learned and Lessons Learning. And I'm going to be talking about some lessons from two trials, Action and LAMP. Whoops, just trying to move some stuff around. 
because it's blocking my presentation. Let's see. Okay. Um, these are two trials of non-pharmacological pain treatments for veterans with chronic pain in the VA healthcare system. So just to give you some context, in the VA, the racial and ethnic minority patient population is predominantly Black, and it's more likely to be younger and female than non-Latinx white veterans, but still mostly male. And in terms of the context, there's really some shared experiences in the military and in the VA system. You know, for example, in the areas of treatment for chronic pain, and for women, many have experienced military sexual trauma, and um, some have experienced sexual harassment in their VAs. So these are just important contextual factors. So one study I'll be talking about is called Action, or Taking Action to Improve Pain. This is a walking-focused, proactive coaching intervention aimed at addressing contributors to racial disparities in pain. And I'll talk about proact the proactive aspects soon. We exceeded our enrollment goal for Black patients. So our goal was to have half of the 500 patients enrolled be Black veterans. Um, we actually had 380 um, Black patients enrolled. And just for some context, 60% of the Black patients had um, an income equal or less than 40%, and 54% had at least one mental illness diagnosis in the electronic health record. And we did have a good follow-up. We had 79% complete the five, six month follow-up um, assessment, which we thought was really good. This was funded by VA HSRD. So LAMP is, um, stands for Learning to Apply Mindfulness to Pain. And it's a mindfulness-based intervention to improve chronic pain outcomes among VA patients. This is in progress. And we're focusing on addressing the needs of women veterans, which, as I mentioned, is a much more racially and ethnically diverse group than the male veterans. And it's funded by the Department of Defense, and it's part of the NIH DOD VA Pain Management Collaboratory. So um, I was guided in um, organizing this by Dr. Jackson's framework, which was super helpful. And my first lesson is, sounds obvious, but um, is not as easy as it sounds, is just choosing study sites with a high percentage of racial and ethnic minority patients. So we know from the data that racial and ethnic minority patients are concentrated in certain healthcare facilities. Our study action was delivered by phone which allowed us to choose a study site with a high percentage of Black patients. So I'm situated in Minneapolis. We conducted the study pretty much for Minneapolis, but it was the patients were from the Atlanta VA. And in LAMP, we likewise chose sites with higher percentage of racial and ethnic minorities. And one important thing to, to bring up is that the choice of sites are affected by the composition of one study team and one social network leading certain sites to be overrepresented. So for example, um, LAMP is part of the Pain Management Collaboratory, 11 pragmatic trials, and certain sites, you know, Los Angeles, um, West Haven, Minneapolis are overrepresented because that's where we have many academic pain researchers. So I think this really points to um, how we need to broaden ways to recruit our study teams you know, at a sponsor level. Um, I think Dr. Cook talked about some of this. We need to have review criteria that really increase diversity of sites, diversity of teams. And then this really speaks to broader diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts. And I know that DA HSRD, my funding home, is um, focused on some, you know, exactly that, really just increasing um, the pool of researchers from racially and ethnically diverse groups. So lesson two is that proactive, um, aware, proactive outreach can help address barriers of awareness, engagement, interest, knowledge, and mistrust. So proactive outreach is a systems level strategy and patient engagement model in which you identify and reach out to patients to connect them with treatment or your intervention. And this is in contrast to a reactive model of care where, um, you know, patients have to seek this out. 
And this can really be employed um, in the context of healthcare systems like the VA. So LAMP and Action use recruitment packets sent to um, VA patients with chronic pain diagnoses in the electronic health record. And these packets, as I'll talk about, were, were developed with input from patients to overcome a lot of these barriers, mistrust, knowledge, information. And in both of these studies, we follow it by phone calls with staff who are trained in communication skills. So move on. Leading to lesson three, patient input and patient advisory boards have been critical in helping us address numerous barriers. So here um, are some photos from one session of some of our LAMP veteran engagement group as we were working on our recruitment materials. So the LAMP veteran engagement panel um, worked similarly to, um, I think, some, some stuff that um, Dr. Cook talked about in PCORI. We involved our um, group from the very beginning um, in the, you know, before as we were developing all of our materials and some of our strategies, our group members are paid and we do formative evaluation um, throughout to make sure that we're structuring the groups in ways that um, people feel comfortable with that are conducive. We ended up making our groups longer so there was more time for participation. In fact, some of our groups prior to COVID were three hours with food, but it was great experience and um, it's really helping us. And likewise, focus groups with black VA patients with chronic pain gave critical input on our action recruitment materials. So our initial recruitment brochure and letter just had so many problems. I mean, now it was sort of a disaster. And we did these focus groups and we did sort of iterative focus groups. So we went to the Atlanta VA and just a couple of themes that emerged, there was a lot of institutional mistrust particularly in terms of this being a VA study, which was highlighted in the initial embouchure. And this importantly occurred during VA's efforts to reduce opioids and to get people off high, you know, long-term high-dose opioids. A lot of skepticism, who's doing the research and why, and a lot of skepticism and lack of understanding about the intervention, which was really the fault of our materials. How does the intervention work? How can walking help me with my pain? I already know I should exercise. How will this intervention help? How can someone coach me over the phone? Is this like telemarketing? So leading to number four, make sure your materials are motivating to potential participants and convey the what and the why. So we really talked about our coaches. So this was not just telemarketing. It's like, who are these people? We talked about their training, we had pictures, we talked about who we were, our study team, why walk, why is walking helpful? A lot of these not pharmacological um, interventions just don't fit into necessarily our cultural conception of how pain is treated. And then we really did a lot to describe action from the perspective of the patient you know, really talking about what they would be doing and why. And then we got additional feedback from the patients who'd be participating. So that was critical. And related to this is lesson five, build trust by explaining who you are and why you care about pain research. So um, this is for LAMP. This is part of our newsletter and brochure in the recruitment packet. So we have pictures of our LAMP team, and we talk about how we're a team of researchers, healthcare providers, and veterans who are committed to improving pain care for veterans. Um, and then we have newsletters that we don't just send out in the beginning, we're sending them throughout the study period. And we're trying to do a lot of Q and A's with members of the research team. So this is one with Sean Green, who's an army veteran and a member of our advisory panel, and just asking questions. Can you tell us about who you are and why pain research is important to you? Why should veterans consider participating in LAM? What would you say to a veteran who feels isolated or hopeless about his or her pain? Because our stakeholders and you know people in our advisory um, groups talked about how that was very common. People feel really isolated and hopeless. What resources would you recommend? Lesson six. Again, maybe obvious, but choose an intervention that is of high value to our population. 
we sort of got lucky, um, although it wasn't just luck, that trials of NPTs, which a lot of us are doing, non-pharmacological treatment for pain, really fulfill unmet needs for better pain treatment, especially those not involving medication. And I think sometimes um, physicians have had some misperceptions that patients just want pain. But when we talk to patients, they really wanted more choices um, and they weren't happy with the treatment they were receiving. And these are things that you need to convey in your materials. In action, there was also an appeal of coaching, especially among those with comorbid mental health conditions and unmet mental health needs. And that was a lot of this group. Um, one of our six group participants said that the coaching calls would give him hope. And here are some quotes from our focus groups of Black VA patients with chronic pain pointing to the need for non-pharmacological treatment. I think about the time that we got into the military. It was great, everything was fine, our health was good. And we'd like to continue with the same thing once we'd gotten out or finished, but we can't because it seems like it gave us more pain. It hurt us more. We're out there helping the people, but it hurt us more, our bodies. Then when we ask for the help, we can't get the help, but we gave them the help. And it's getting progressively worse. And they give us drugs. And there you go, Percocet, Tramadol, Vicodin. I said, I don't want any more drugs. So I'm just dealing with the pain without drugs. There's no other support, just pain meds, and that's it. So I think that was a lot of why we got a really good turnout was unfortunately because there was a lot of unmet needs. Okay, lesson seven. You really, we really need to counter cultural messages about non-pharmacological treatment and complementary and integrative health approaches. So most, but not all studies find that complementary and integrative health is more likely to be used by non-Latinx whites and patients of higher socioeconomic status, including for pain. And there's many barriers for racial and ethnic minorities who want NPTs or CIH approaches, but representation is a big one. And I Googled time and meditation because I had heard and vaguely remembered that there was a famous time cover with a white woman on the, on the cover promoting meditation. And I found three covers of white women, thin, young, able-bodied, promoting mindfulness and meditation. The same thing happens if you look for yoga. And of course, this is terrible. It's not, you know, it's not good. It makes people feel that these um, approaches aren't for them. And we really need to counter this in our own materials and, you know, more broadly. Lesson eight, um, I view pragmatic um, clinical trials where things are um, occurring in, in within at least somewhat of a healthcare system. And we really need to pay attention to discrimination and hostile climate issues that may exist within these clinical settings where the studies are conducted. So for example, 24% of female veterans in one study experienced sexual harassment at their VAs and 50 to 40, 15 to 40% experienced military sexual trauma. You know, this is um, sexual trauma while they were in the military. And this is an issue for LAM, which really wanted to engage female veterans and included these in-person mindfulness groups. These issues were raised by our LAM veteran and stakeholder engagement panel members and we did end up switching to virtual groups due to COVID-19. So that eliminated some barriers, but we have been thinking about other solutions, you know, monitoring the climate, choosing our sites carefully, and really remembering that, you know, we may be doing a really good job within our, um, in this case, within our groups um, to create a safe space, but veteran, female veterans were going to have to walk into the doors, into the VAs, and it's just really challenging and we need to think about these things. Okay, just, just to close, um, I think there's some real promise and potential perils for um, diversity and inclusion as more studies are conducted virtually. So we know um, with COVID, it just accelerated um, studies and care being conducted virtually. So um, at one level, we're able to reach underserved populations, such as, you know, for us, rural veterans, veterans from racial and ethnic minority groups who, um, are outside healthcare facilities where investigators are located. And like I mentioned, often the facilities they get chosen are ones that are part of these academic health um, settings where their investigators are just studying the topic. And some access barriers that were talked about previously are reduced, like transportation, jobs, but others are increased. You know, we all know about the digital divide, lack of broadband, privacy, 
And for LAMP, when we switch to um, virtual, we work with our um, veteran um, engagement panel to create materials and processes to help participants become more comfortable with the technology because many um, didn't use technology um, like our investigators in their daily lives who maybe were in front of um, Zoom all day. So we added an extra training session to our research protocol. We reallocated resources to provide additional support. And we really became, we really had to get in the sort of tech business and understand like how, how do these materials work and just get input on what was clear, what wasn't clear. And I think this is gonna be just a challenge as we, we go forward, you know, in 2021. So, um, so that's it. But, um, you know, again, this is a great topic and I'm really excited to um, keep pursuing this with all of my um, great colleagues. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. And uh, Diana, and now we're going to turn to Errol Patterson. Errol is a uh, trial lawyer, lawyer, professor at Georgetown Law School. And he has been working with our um, project on understanding the transition from acute to chronic pain. Um, this is a, 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 a large common fund uh, research project. And one of the groups is looking at uh, people who undergo total knee replacement um, and uh, trying to understand why some develop chronic pain, others don't, uh, with the hope that we can find some preventative strategies in the future. So Errol? Well, thank you and greetings everyone uh, from a snowy Washington. Uh, as was indicated, I, for, since roughly September 2019, uh, have functioned as the patient representative on the acute to chronic pain signature study that's being run by NIH. And in that capacity, I've provided a patient perspective uh, to the consortium and to NIH with respect to you know, a variety of issues, compensation, patient burden, or whatever. Um, so I, I'm gonna have a very short presentation uh, for you today. And again, it, it's uh, focused on uh, uh, the patient's perspective, my perspective for a different patient. Uh, you could very much, very well I would expect to get uh, different views or ideas or even disagreements. Um, so to start with a disclaimer and acknowledgement, I mean, unlike the stellar uh, voices you've heard from already uh, today, um, I'm not an expert in this field. Um, I come to it with just a, uh, a lay person's uh, perspective, much like Lucy from the Peanuts cartoon, you know, my opinions aren't worth a whole lot. Occasionally they may rise to a thought for the day or some sound advice, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's what uh, I'm gonna to try to offer over uh, the next few slides. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Errol, we cannot see your slides right now. Oh, okay. Let me uh, let me back up then. Thank you. Sure. How about that? Now we can yes. see them. Okay. Thank you, Cherise. You know, with all this technology, after teaching for virtually for a year, you'd think I would remember some of the basic steps, but uh, uh, we got there. Okay. So uh, my disclaimer acknowledgement uh, focused on the, the penis cartoon Lucy. And as, as I say, uh, these are just one patient's uh, perspective and uh, they come to it from a, a lay person's perspective. So I guess the first thing I would just like to, you know, as you've heard today, uh, as a general observation, um, the topic of diversity and inclusion in clinical trials is clearly nothing new uh, if you look at just the, quickly at the literature since the 80s, the FDA has focused on uh, this on this issue. Uh, as Dr. Mensa eloquently uh, described, uh, 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 NIH is under a legal obligation 
to include diversity and inclusion. And that's been the case since 1993. Uh, and the Food and Drug Administration uh, has been issuing reports as we saw uh, from the presentation uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Jackson uh, since at least 2012. All of which leads me to say, so what gives, you know? This quote, it's not that minorities are hard to reach, but they're hardly reached, I think puts a very fine point on it. Uh, it makes one wonder whether or not we're actually reaching out sufficiently uh, to minority populations. And for me, uh, my, per my perspective is gonna be as an African-American, how does one address that? Well, there is an English proverb and uh, that says, where there's a will, there's a way. Or as my family likes to say to me, you know, I always see uh, the glass is half full and not half empty. So what are the barriers that I see to standing in the way to uh, diversity and inclusion? And I think what one can never ignore is just simply the multicultural divide that exists in this country. By way of education and experiences, both professionally and in my own family, you know, I have lived in what I would call a very diverse environment. However, I, I traveled to Ethiopia at one point in the past on a work assignment and when I got off the plane and looked out, my reaction was, these people look just like me. And there was this sort of immediate sort of familiarity that came with simply not knowing anything else, that there may be some shared experiences. And that is something that, you know, is unavoidable. So in terms of when we approach, you know, recruitment and retention, how are we attempting to address that? I've heard and read in, the, in, in many uh, uh, contexts that one of the problems is identifying sufficient number of patients in the community, okay? Lack of meaningful engagement within the community. And we've heard a lot of discussion today about what meaningful engagement means. Patient mistrust, and I highlight the Tuskegee syphilis experiment because in fact, I grew up in Tuskegee. And I'd lived in that community for many of the years that that experiment was taking place. And I have to believe that maybe I knew some of the people that were enrolled in that study. That memory is going to be very profound even today with many African Americans. And Tuskegee, in case you don't know, is also very prominent in the African American history. It was the uh, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, all hailed from Tuskegee, who were very prominent in the African-American community. The Tuskegee Airmen, which had now had been made into a movie, was focused on Tuskegee. And for those of us who are you know, much younger, it's also where uh, Lionel Richie went to schools. And uh, uh, so that memory uh, is, is, is out there. And, and, and so mistrust in the African-American community about clinical studies is a really a real uh, concern. And then we've heard about lack of appreciation for the prevalence of disease and potential benefits. Again, I'm not gonna talk about, I'm not an expert in those, but they were flagged today. And I think those are real uh, as well. So what are the potential pathways, pathways to success? Well, I think, you know, again, as a lay person's perspective, it requires direct engagement, involvement and recruitment within the African-American community. You can't do it from afar. I think you really have to get into those communities uh, and uh, make the contacts. It's, again, it's not rocket science and it's nothing new that I came up with, but alliances and support from historically black medical schools, I think, you know, is one pathway to success. There are really only four and they are located geographically on the East Coast at Howard University, 
the West Coast, at the Charles Drew Medical Center, sort of in the Midwest, it depends on how you view uh, Nashville, Tennessee, at Meharry, and then Atlanta at Morehouse. If, if trust is an issue in recruitment, then these medical schools, you know, are very highly trusted entities. They have a long tradition of medical research on diabetes, cancer, sickle cell, hypertension, and other diseases within the Black community. And they have demonstrated the capacity for testing, providing medical care, and doing research. So if I was running, if I was an investigator, I would at least want to consider some sort of alliance or support from historically Black medical schools. Alliances and support from African-American churches. Again, faith-based organizations, we heard again, a general recognition from all our speakers earlier today about the role of faith-based uh, organizations. I highlight one in particular that is somewhat a recent development, not because it's the only one, but I think it, it's a self-recognition within the African-American faith-based organizations of the impact that those organizations can have. And they've launched the Choose Healthy Life Initiative. And when you take a look at it and, and go up to some of the goals and objectives, it addresses a lot of the things that people talked about today, earlier, as to keys to success. Awareness and education and infrastructure and being able to have a, a sustainable model that could be applied in many different contexts. One of the things I noticed in particular about this organization and the goals is they're currently operating in five major cities, New York, Newark, Atlanta, Detroit, and Washington, is they're going to have what is referred to as a, uh, let me go back to my slides, a public health navigator, sort of a one-stop shopping center. So if you were looking for a population, a diverse population to include in a study, you might wanna check to see if there's a black church public health navigator that could provide some assistance to you in putting together uh, your patients. So it's just you know one organization, there are others, every local, area community, uh, I'm sure has an African American church, whether it's a rural town in America or a big city, uh, who would be, I think, receptive to a discussion about how they might add uh, to your participation. I can't get this top screen to go away. But it, what it says is other African-American professional health organizations. And I note that the US Department of Health and Human Services maintains on their website, a list of those organizations nationally. And you can scroll down and do that for different populations, whether it's the African-American Breast Cancer Alliance, Black cardiologists, psychologists, so on and so forth, who are there as a, a resource, an information resource. So obviously it would seem to me one but one that you know maybe already doing it, but check the list. It could be a resource you could tap into that could be of, of some of some help. 25 national organizations. And lastly, if anyone has listened to me at, with the uh, acute to chronic pain signature program, uh, I beat uh, to a dead horse the impact of financial considerations in my mind uh, that would impact the will and the way. I mean, from the patient's point of view, from my point of view, one, it benefits the patient. Two, it's a signal to the patient that he or she is highly valued. And it also shows the importance of the study. When you underfund patient compensation, I think you send a negative message on all three of those topics. 
I noticed that the general counsel for Coca-Cola on Friday announced that the, what they've been trying to do in diversity and inclusion were, was not working. And as of today, they were instituting a much more rigorous and mandatory policy. And I see correlations between that and clinical trials. The funding of the study components must ensure that there's sufficient funds for recruitment and retention. And then meeting those uh, diversity and inclusion goals must you know, be either rewarded or penalized depending upon uh, the results. Those are tangible real things that I think you know, uh, uh, would create and assist in both enrollment and uh, retention. So I think I had 10 minutes, I'm done. I thank you for your time. And uh, I've been so impressed with all that I've heard today. Uh, and uh, it's a credit to uh, the speakers, NIH and the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Patterson. It's an excellent talk. Um, I just want to mention to everyone in the audience that we have one more speaker presentation and then we'll be opening up for a broader discussion. So please go ahead and text in questions that you have now if you'd like. Um, and for um, our last um, speaker presentation, we have Adam Anisich, um, who is the chair of the patient resource group for the NIH DOD and VA Pain Management Collaboratory. So um, welcome, Adam, and please go ahead. Sounds good, thanks, Beth. Thanks, uh, Drs. Baker and Sankar. I know, um, you know you had a choice of uh, people to invite today, and I appreciate the invitation. Um, Drs. Cook and Mensa, thank you for uh, opening us up today, kind of uh, getting our minds uh, moving on this topic. I really appreciate that. Uh, glad to be here, uh, glad to be with uh, some of my uh, brilliant partners in crime, Diana Burgess being one of them from uh, Minnesota here from earlier. Uh, my name is Adam Anisich, and uh, I'm going to share a little bit about engaging patients, investigators, and stakeholders in order to reach the whole community. So we're going to take a look at um, different strategies and ways that you can do that. Uh, I know I'm uh, up last, so, uh, you know, you give me nine minutes of your life, and I will change your world. Overpromise and undeliver, underdeliver. Uh, Kim, next slide, please. <laughs> Read it on the internet, right? So, um, in a former life, I ran Congressional Affairs for VA, and since uh, about 2017, I serve on the uh, Veterans uh, Interagency Veterans Advisory Council. We uh, we represent about 500,000 federal veteran employees and uh, try and support accl uh, acclimation, recruitment, retention um, in the federal civilian service. So a little bit of a different role. Um, today, I'm here as the uh, chair of the Patient Resource Group for the uh, VA DoD NIH Pain Management Collaboratory. Uh, views are my own, and uh, I'm on leave for the duration of the uh, presentation. So uh, next slide, Kim. So we're talking about patient engagement, right? Um, what, is, what does that mean? Are we just talking to the community? Are we gathering a few uh, token stakeholders to say, hey, we got some patients on board? Um, you know, so in today's session, I'll show you a couple things. First, how to manage patient engagement, how to facilitate the actual um, engagement dialogue with patients, and then finally, how to put it to work for you. So first we have to ask ourselves, right, what is a PRG? What is a patient resource group? So next slide, please, Kim. Um, a, a PRG is basically something that we founded because it provides a formalized mechanism to solicit stakeholder feedback. So it's supporting the PIs and the leadership. It's supporting the patient uh, participants, right? These are the, uh, the potential participants in your studies. And it's, it's supporting the external stakeholders, which is a crucial a really a crucial dynamic to all of this. Um, we think it's very innovative. It allows a community connected, realistic feedback loop that so many studies haven't historically had, but also um, I think are very much trending in that direction. So the first thing we really have to ask ourselves is why, right? Uh, Kim, next slide. So why? Um, why do we need patient input? Can't the uh, PIs just control for uh, the variables across the different groups, right? Um, my favorite is, uh, you know, how many times have you heard, well, <laughs> I have a PhD and an MD, so I have a pretty good understanding of what this population needs. Or, uh, you know, I've been researching this population for 20 years, so I understand them, right? That's not the type of attitude that we're trying to uh, perpetuate. So, uh, Kim, just the first animation, 
really what we're looking at is there, there, illust- there, there needs to be an understanding that there's a divide, right? There's a divide between what the PIs and the investigators are really uh, understanding life is like and what the potential patients are able to communicate their life is like um, or even articulate kind of their lived, lived experiences. And, um, you know, I think this is really exacerbated from some of our disadvantaged populations. Um, you know, Dr. Mensa actually, we did not coordinate beforehand, but, but he used two of uh, my items, which one was, you know, the, the PI is on the phone. Great. You know, when can you come in and sign your enrollment paperwork for the study? Right. And the, the patient goes, well, I can't, you know, I'm working my second job or I don't have a car. Right. So, um, Kim, advance the uh, next animation, if you don't mind. Um, so what we're really looking at is this gap here, right? It's, it's this gap that is filled or bridged by a, a representative patient stakeholder group, right? We call it the PRG. And, and it really brings those two together so that you don't have these types of problems. Um, so on the next slide, you know, what does a PRG do, right? It supports three major groups, the PIs and the study leadership, the potential participants are the patients and the external stakeholders. Those are the three groups. So with PIs, we're looking at things like providing letters of support that indicate the inclusion of the whole community, or perhaps uh, providing expertise and targeting a specific patient population. With the patients, we're looking at explaining the, excuse me, explaining the benefits of research, uh, identifying um, avenues to access patient populations that the PIs may not have even known existed, and, and really building those relationships with those communities. Um, with the stakeholders, we're creating, we're cultivating advocacy. We're, we're disseminating the results and, and bringing those stakeholders into the fray as an active participant, as a partner, so that they're vested in the outcome. So, you know, who is part of our patient group, right? Uh, on the next slide, the composition of the PMC3, you're going to see that our patient group is comprised of members spanning a wide range of representations, right? Veterans, active duty, military, caregivers, first responders. They come from di- diverse ethnic, gender, age, wartime era, ailment backgrounds, um, and, they, and they have um, really unique skills. We thought very um, intently on identifying individuals with unique skills who also had a very um, in-depth community connectedness, which is something you'll hear me talk about. You know, people whose lived experiences kind of spanned multiple roles. So, for example, one of our, our veterans is a, a veteran, uh, somebody who has experienced chronic pain and is also a clinical provider. So they have kind of the, the, the population understanding. They have these specific individual lived experiences, but they're also on the other side of the coin as a, a provider. So when we're doing this, we're thinking strategically about adding value by adding members to the PRG, right? How is a member connected to the community or what unique skills uh, are, are they going to add or insight are they going to add to your research? So thinking kind of more macro uh, with a more macro perspective, what if we took this concept and expanded it to ensure that the whole community was represented, right? Next slide, Kim. Um, what if we were able to provide a voice for the voiceless, right? So as part of this concept, uh, good friend Sean Green chairs the Health Equity Group, which was developed to support these four activities, right? Reducing bias in health research, ensuring that historically disadvantaged populations are appropriately represented in health research studies, grants, trials, funding, et cetera. Um, helping eliminate barriers to high-quality healthcare in minority communities, and advising on general minority-related issues. So when, when we're thinking about this, right, it's what value does this concept, this wholly inclusive concept, bring to your research? Are, are there certain elements of your research that can be improved because you've in, included this diverse perspective? One size doesn't fit all, so everybody's research study is different, so it's not like, yes, and here's why. It's, I would encourage you to think about how it could benefit, because I think you'll be surprised at the outcome of that, that line of thought and questioning of yourself. So uh, next slide, please. Um, on to slide nine, the PRG in action, right? These are um, 
you know, some, some concrete examples of what we do, right? We obtain buy-in from leaders, stakeholders, community, have external discussions, review materials, contribute to study designs, things like that, right? Some of my favorite questions are when uh, a, a PI, you know, I'm consulting with a PI and they're like, you know, you know, well, why wouldn't a veteran want to get op off opioids, right? That, they just assume everyone wants to get off opioids because that's the trend, especially a couple years ago. It's like, no, there's a million reasons why they wouldn't, namely one of them being the fact that they feel their disability compensation, i.e. the money side of VA that they're getting, could be negatively impacted if they stop taking the meds that VA is prescribing and vice versa, right? So there's this kind of, um, you know, anybody that doesn't believe me, I'll show you a million threads online about it. Um, you know, there's these, these challenges that are inherent that Sometimes researchers, because they can't see across that delta through no fault of their own, the patient resource group is able to bridge those gaps, right? Or, <clears throat> excuse me, another favorite question of mine is, have you ever talked with a veteran? No, why would I do that? <laughs> well, you've been a researcher for 20 years. You've never talked with a veteran. No, I've got all the data in front of me. It's just not the same, right? So, so the patient resource group really helps to bridge that gap. Um, some of the things we do, various collection instruments are developed, but has anybody actually looked at them? right, uh, in the nuances in the veteran and military community. Uh, does, do your recruitment materials talk about recruiting on an Army base, but you show Marine Corps uniforms, or you're talking about recruiting Navy, but you're referring to them as soldiers? It's like watching a bad movie that doesn't quite fit. It's all technically accurate, but the nuances make it laughable. So when we think about diversity and inclusion, what you, you know, you don't want somebody like me lecturing you, somebody who looks like me lecturing you, right? You want someone who represents the community that's persevered through those lived experiences. And a PRG is able to assemble those folks to make that happen. They codify it, they make it into a structured capability that you and your research team then have to use. So uh, on the next slide, you know, this is very simple and I need you all to understand this. A representative PRG can help you better calibrate your research with the communities that you are seeking to help, right? That's my pitch. That is, you, you can sum it up in one slide, that's my pitch. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, even if you don't like anything that I've said so far, if you're like, whatever, this guy's crazy, why are we listening to him at four, you know, a little after four in the afternoon, right? Research is a business. Following a patient engaged model is going to make you more competitive, okay? When we're talking about research, you know, it has to align with the agency mission. You've never heard a president or a health secretary say, you know, our mission, my agency's mission is to do a really good job of research. Oh, and also take care of patients and uh, run our programs great, right? Research supports operations, not the other way around. So we wanna make sure that we are aligning with the agency's mission. Dollars follow priorities, okay? Simple as that. If your research is focused on a priority area, there will, there will be dollars following that. Um, patient research, when you're doing and executing the patient research, it has to be patient-focused and community-relevant. That's getting feedback and the input from community stakeholders, whether they be members of Congress or people who are sitting on the side of the curb in your local communities, right? Everybody does have a voice in these types of operations, and we encourage you to find ways to formalize that input. Um, you know, and involved community partners are a great way to do that. They have a vested interest in your success. They want to see you succeed. So if you're able to bring them on, especially in the early stages, provide updates throughout your research life cycle, and then help have them help you disseminate the results, you're going to be in a great spot because they're going to be your biggest advocate, your biggest cheerleaders. And then finally, right, the, the so what. Right, we spent four years and $3 million on your research, so what? How does it change the average American's life? How does it contribute to the, the body of knowledge? How do you have some impact with your research, right? You know, the, the best way to then loop, answer that question is to say, you know, here's the impact we have and here's how it ties in to the agency priorities today. A PRG helps you stay funded and can continue your work over the long term. That is. That is the, the absolute kind of bottom line here. Having an inclusive representative PRG will help you get your work funded to be able to continue your research. So uh, Kim, next slide. The uh, last slide is just questions. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I know it's the end of the day. Um, great panel, great discussion today. 
I'll be around for questions. My contact info is on the slides. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Adam, for a terrific talk. Um, and now we're going to go into the discussion portion for the whole panel. Um, and I just want to make a, a quick clarification that the um, questions that we're going to be drawing from are questions that were pre-populated earlier. Those of you um, in the audience who sent in questions earlier, we will not be doing a live Q&A, but the panelists will be answering those questions. Um, I just want to start off the conversation by referencing uh, Dr. Cook's excellent talk. And she brought forward these definitions about inclusion and engagement, um, with inclusion being behaviors that help people feel valued and a sense of belonging. Um, she also highlighted engagement as being the involvement of stakeholders in every aspect of the research process. And she noted that inclusion and engagement um, when applied in research can help address these issues of distrust that are quite pervasive. We see that people with chronic pain are highly stigmatized. We see that people who have OUD are also highly stigmatized. On top of that, Black, Indigenous, and people of color have experienced further stigma, historical biases and harms in medical uh, treatment and research that results in perhaps an unwillingness to participate in our research, even when the logistics allow for that participation. So I just wanted to start off the conversation with a question for Mr. Patterson. As a person with pain and as a Black individual, what is the most important step that researchers or the NIH can take to address the dis distrust that exists within communities, help them heal and enhance engagement and inclusion? And I know that your whole presentation, you brought forward these really rich examples, but I just wanted you to give you the opportunity um, to say if there was one thing that really rose to the top. Well, I think that the, uh, the question causes me to reflect back upon my own experience uh, in uh, going through the, the knee replacement and the rehab recovery and, and, and the like. And um, I will say, you know, I was, it would, it, again, it would be helpful to see more people, more people of color involved in the process. I think that helps towards, you know, mitigating concerns, uh, trust concerns. Um, and I think that requires a, you know, a directed effort by the, everyone involved from the beginning to the end to include people of color uh, in the process uh, as one way of, of addressing the trust factor. Uh, again, I mean, there's no, a uh, simple way of, 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 of gaining someone's trust uh, that takes, you know, a certain amount of chemistry. Um, and not to say in any way, I mean, I trusted my, my surgeon completely or I would have made a choice, but just generally, I think that that's, uh, you, you want to have, make sure your, your process includes people that look like the patients that you're dealing with. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, George Mensa is still on. I, I, um, so, George. Uh, Walter, uh, certainly. Yeah, George. Yeah, all, right. I'm, I'm, so, yeah. <laughs> all right. So, I'm, I was going to put you on the spot, George. I just want to make sure you were still there. <laughs> I, I am here. It took all me right. a while to unmute, but I'm unmuted. Okay. <laughs> So George, uh, I guess, uh, so you've been listening and, and I think we've heard some so many interesting points today, um, um, but you have certainly been in this business for a long time. And so I wondered if um, two things, whether any of the things that you heard today, you think should be you know, elevated to really high priority and, um, and given you know, the, the fact that you've been working in this space for a long time, and seeing what happened with SEAL, uh, my, my sense of what I heard is that it really, the success kind of went above and beyond what people had expected. And I, I was wondering if, if, if you know, 
given all the other things you've done, why this one seemed to work so well, if, if I may be presumptuous. Um, you certainly give us more credit than we probably deserve, Walter. Um, the, the, the truth is it's been a, a, an all hands on board uh, approach, uh, everyone chipping in to help. If I were to state a, a couple of things that have been absolutely crucial, it would have to be the recognition that you don't do outreach as a one-way effort. It's a two-way effort and it begins with listening so you can yourself even tailor your messages to the appropriate needs of the community. Communities vary. Uh, and to the notion that uh, we have a certain expertise and we're going to reach out, uh, it doesn't work that way. That's the first. The second is sometimes there is a, a, a need uh, to move fast, particularly when you're dealing with issues around pain or, or the pandemic. Uh, and it's important not to rush the communities. Uh, it's taken a long time to get to where they are. And so being patient and listening can also help you tailor the messages. And I'll say finally is that the trust issue has been mentioned so many times. It's critical. If we don't build the trust in the first place, it's very difficult uh, to have a foundation upon which uh, to be successful. So listening, a two-way approach, um, uh, not rushing, move at the speed of trust uh, and always make trust and proving ourselves trustworthy uh, would really solidify the relationship and make us successful. Yeah, because research is really about a relationship. It's the subject and the researcher and they have to be partners. Um, and so I must say that the you know, doing chronic diseases, you, you, you build relationships over years with some, uh, basically your friends, they become your friends after years. Um, and it's a, it's a, I think it's fulfilling on both sides uh, when that happens. But it does take, that takes a lot of time. Uh, Beth? Yeah, thank you. Um, so this next question is for Dr. Jackson. And um, you're, in your presentation, you really talked about how uh, you, you questioned what is, what is a minority even, what's an Asian, the idea that um, individuals are not representation of a monolith. And I was wondering if you could speak more to what we need to do to capture the diversity of diversity. What are we missing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you, Beth. Um, so, so I want to drive home the point with an illustrative example um, from the field of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, a group of my colleagues uh, at the University of Wisconsin, led by Carrie Gleason, uh, published a really, really elegant study of exactly this issue back in 2019. Uh, where they looked at uh, all of the all of the participants who had contributed to the uh, the the NAC data set, which is one of our largest resources to understand Alzheimer's disease, and what they found um, somewhat surprisingly in that data set, which, which contained about 4,000 individuals, uh, was that Black people got Alzheimer's disease or they progressed to full blown dementia at about half the rate of White people. Uh, in the study, which is uh, for anybody who understands the disparities or the inequities in Alzheimer's disease is, is a complete reversal of what you tend to find. Uh, Black and African Americans are about twice, uh, almost as, uh, as, as high as four times as likely to develop dementia. So why does this large data set, which is one of our largest resources, why is, it, why is there a reversal of that problem? And the issue is that, um, you know, the problem is of pursuing diversity at the cost of inclusion. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, all of the white people came from a memory clinic where, of course, the base rate of dementia is going to be higher. All of the black people came from a community sample where the base rate of dementia is going to be lower. And so because people were, were so uh, blinded by, you know, the brown faces that they were able to pull into the study, they didn't pay attention to the other really crucial factors uh, that were absolutely vital in understanding that the basic uh, 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 pathophysiology uh, and the basic risk progression uh, for something like Alzheimer's disease. Now, if we try to blindly pursue 
uh, some kind of superficial type of diversity without thinking a little bit more broadly about what that diversity might represent, especially in terms of understanding the theoretical uh, uh, constructs of the disease that we're trying to study, we're going to run to the same problem. Now, the, the reducto ad absurdum uh, of, of pursuing diversity is that you want to have one of every type or you wanna have enough of every type that you don't have to deal with this issue. Um, and so that's why uh, you know, pursuing diversity is nice, uh, but recognizing that we need to think a little bit more about our inclusion or our inclusivity uh, uh, paradigms is, is the real solution. So instead of saying we need everybody to participate because that's a great goal, but not realistic, we wanna make it so that anyone, truly anyone can participate. And so if we design our studies for those things and we are thoughtful about measuring um, any social determinants of health, uh, then we can truly understand why we, we might get the, you know, this kind of weird reversal that we saw, like I illustrated with the NAC data set. So pursuing diversity is great, try to measure that, but recognize that people aren't just representing, uh, you know, the entire group that, that you are putting them into. Uh, so, so, you know, I think we need to be better about our measurements and making sure that our, our samples are truly comparable, not just in terms of uh, you know, comparing and, con and contrasting on, uh, on the basis of race or on the basis of urbanicity and rurality, uh, but recognizing that there are many social determinants that, uh, that are, are really important and that we have to, to make sure that we are making sure that uh, folks from all walks of life are able to participate. So, you know, for example, if, we, if we're talking about um, health equity in this particular uh, const construct, um, by recognizing the barriers uh, that Black and African Americans face, uh, by recognizing you know, the language equity considerations that individuals uh, who, who struggle with English proficiency, proficiency face, uh, we, we may find that we're, we're able to include other groups of uh, individuals that we, that we weren't considering. So you know, specifically uh, uh, white and Caucasian individuals that don't have a high income, that don't have high educational attainment, and you know, that, that um, you know, would really benefit from our plain language requirements. So it's not just about uh, you know, bringing in uh, uh, you know, the, the voices of the church because that's how you reach black people. It's recognizing that church, the churches have built an infrastructure to reach all kinds of people um, that are traditionally hard, hard to reach for, from the research perspective. So measure more than what you think you need to, really hit those social determinants of hard, uh, otherwise, you may end up achieving diversity at the cost of inclusion, uh, and that's just a whole other mess that we'll have to solve. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Cook a question. Um, as was mentioned, she was previously at NHLBI, and, uh, and George is there as well. And so um, the three of us are always wondering about how to uh, best use our funds and um, I must say, I, I feel that we've kind of, at least at our institute, kind of shortchanged the, the funding of these kind of efforts. And now at the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, I'm wondering um, what, what the philosophy is there in terms of the financing of these efforts to allow uh, these trials to get the kind of engagement that you need uh, for uh, the diversity. You know, it's a very interesting question because it was uh, very new to me in terms of thinking about this approach that PCORI has as compared to what I was used to at traditional NIH funding. And there are two ways at PCORI that we really um, fund engagement efforts. One is, is that we actually have an engagement awards program where we have funded applicants, um, awardees that are focused on engaging certain communities both to think about building capacity, generating the topics that are important um, for patient-centered outcomes research, and how those um, communities and organizations can engage and work. And so there's almost a pipeline of um, building that capacity within communities and with um, patients and other healthcare um, based organizations to be able to participate in our research. And then there's another component that is part of our research funding itself, which um, in our research funding, we've created what we call an engagement rubric that serves as a guide for our um, funded investigators to follow in terms of how to think about engagement. It incorporates a framework for reimbursement for our participants that are um, for our patients and other 
participants that are engaged in the in research and has actually kind of that rubric has influenced the field in terms of other funders now adopting that type of reimbursement model um, for their research when they're thinking about engaging in um, participants in research. And we take one additional step, which is we actually fund the results to patients. So we are fund that last step of making sure that there's the effort of getting the results from the work back to those that were participating and are affected by the work. Um, and so I think that there's a a model there that may be useful. And I will mention that we are in the process of updating our model to um, really emphasize the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and excited about that process and anticipate that that'll be an update that would be very useful to organizations and um, other organizations, as well as groups such as HEAL um, to look at. And so uh, we not only create these things for ourselves, but we want them to be a resource for the community more broadly. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, this is a, a, a question that can be opened up broadly, but I'm going to specifically direct it to Dr. Burgess and Dr. Elliott. Um, what specific elements of the research study and process should be changed to accommodate the specific needs of diverse populations? So that could include a multitude of factors, but in your own experience with your research, um, what advice do you have for researchers? Um, Dr. Burgess, let's start with you, then we'll go to Dr. Elliott. It's such a good question. I keep thinking about virtual care because we all had to sort of change, you know, turn on a dime with um, the um, pain management laboratory and just thinking about so many access barriers. And now in the VA, the VA wants to move to virtual care and we're thinking about all those, you know, all those barriers of broadband, of privacy. So that's one. And then I think that being able to really spend more money that it takes to get less, you know, underrepresented groups, because, you know, for us going, you know, reaching rural veterans, for example, or going outside our sort of comfort zone. It's easy if you have the same investigators in their sites, but every time you sort of go outside this one site that's the same type of people, it requires just, just more, you know, another site PI and so forth. So I think maybe from the sort of systems perspective, figuring out how in a big way we can really try to go outside our usual ways of doing things. Dr. Elliott, please. Sure, oh, I agree. Uh, with so many of those things that were said, it's hard to pick one part of the process that might be more important than others because it's such an ongoing um, sort of thing. But I think if you're first starting out in this, look for low hanging fruit. Look for a place where you can work with a, a community agency and get something actually through to a meaningful product um, for, for that partner um, as early as possible. Um, I love the move at the patient or the, the pace of, um, or the speed of trust. Um, I, I think that I might borrow that one, uh, Dr. Mensch, Mensa, and give you full credit on that. A beautiful saying. Um, because that's very true. You have to find that balance between showing that you're someone who gets something done because a lot of these communities have been fighting these problems and populations for a really long time and have probably had the conversation they're having with you about whatever outcome you're working on. They've probably had it a hundred other times with other people who have promised all kinds of things. And so you really need to like find where is it you can start making an impact as to show that like, okay, let's work together on this. And when we work together, how do we, how do we move the needle um, and then progressively get larger from there? If you start too big, you're going to drown the ship before you even um, can take off. Terrific, thank you. I wanna thank um, Walter for co-leading this discussion, all the panelists um, for um, your great presentations in the discussion. And I wanna turn it over to Dr. Vallejo to close out the meeting. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Dr. Cora Schatz for leading that very informative discussion. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Yolanda Vallejo from the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research where I'm the program director for the oral facial pain portfolio. Today's workshop has addressed some exceedingly important topics, including why inclusion of diverse populations in clinical research is crucial to advancing health equity, 
in pain management and treatment of opioid use disorder. Challenges associated with recruitment, retention and inclusion of diverse populations, lessons learned from prior studies and strategies to overcome existing challenges, and importantly, patient perspectives with the ultimate goal of increasing the generalizability of clinical studies to benefit all populations and improve the overall health of our nation. With that, on behalf of the NIH HEAL Initiative and the NIH Pain Consortium Disparities and Diversity Workgroup, I'd like to thank all of our outstanding speakers, moderators, and attendees for making this vibrant and informative meeting possible. Please note that a summary and a recording of the meeting will be posted, and we'd like to ask that uh, everyone complete the exit survey. And thank you to everyone that made this very important meeting happen. And this concludes our workshop. Everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you.